Japanese Barberry, controlling this public health risk. Produced in cooperation with the University of Connecticut Extension System and the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Japanese Barberry is considered an invasive species. It gets this honor because of its ability to completely take over an area, outcompeting all native plants. In addition to being invasive, which is bad enough, Japanese Barberry has also been found to be an excellent habitat for the deer tick, the same tick that spreads Lyme disease. This three-part video series was developed to give you the information you need to effectively manage this plant and to reduce your risk of getting Lyme disease. The first video in this series explains the Japanese Barberry plant in detail. It shows you how to positively identify it, how it grows and spreads, its link to Lyme disease and the other problems it causes in the forest environment. In this, the second video in the series, we cover the various ways to control this invasive, such as by using a torch or herbicides. The third video in this series focuses in depth on Lyme disease itself, what it is, how it's spread, its symptoms and treatments, and the deer tick's role in spreading the disease. This information, mixed in with many handy tips, will help keep you Lyme disease free. We hope you enjoy this video series. We will start with Mr. Thomas Worthley of the Yukon Cooperative Extension Service, explaining why the use of fire is one of the tools used to control this invasive plant. The notion behind using a propane torch to control invasives comes from the the working hypothesis, if you will, that uh, uh, fire used to be a very uh, significant component in our uh, ecosystem prior to European settlement. Uh, there was fire quite regularly through the woods and um, for any number of reasons. And most of our native species in evolved with fire in, in the environment on a regular basis and so they were adapted to fire being there. Um, it was thought that we that some of the non-native species may not have that same adaptation, uh, but we can't set fires all over the place, and so instead we decided to to bring fire in a small way to try to control some of the non-natives that may not have that same uh, fire adaptation as our native species do. Hello, my name is J.P. Barsky. I also work at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Today, I'm going to be talking with you all about safety. A concept that I developed a couple of years ago is called Safety Yes. Yes is an acronym for yourself, your equipment, and your surroundings. The first part of the acronym, yourself, refers to your physical condition and how you are prepared to work that day. Whether you've had enough fluids to drink and so you're well hydrated, or whether you've had proper amount of rest before working, and you have to kind of know your own limits for the duration of your work. The next part that I would like to talk with you about in the YES acronym is your equipment. Your equipment consists of your propane torch, your safety apparel, including your clothing. You want to make sure your clothing is uh, non-synthetic material, that you're wearing leather boots and leather gloves, safety glasses, a hard hat with hearing protection because the propane torch is quite loud. You also want to be concerned with your propane torch. Make sure that it's um, fully up to speed and got uh, good safety checks for the valve so that you're not leaking any uh, propane gas. The third thing that I would like to speak with you all about is your surroundings. You need to be mindful of the fact that there are such things as widow makers that could fall on you. You have certain tripping hazards below you. You have poison ivy which can uh, burn and inhale those fumes. You also have ticks in the environment and there are a number of other hazards which you need to be mindful of such as the humidity. The humidity greatly affects your, the conditions that you can burn under. Uh, you want to make sure that there has been sufficient rainfall the night prior uh, so that you have a safe burning opportunity. So to reiterate one last time, you need to be careful of yourself, your equipment, and your surroundings. Yeah, one of the potential problems of working with a flamethrower, or just in the woods in general, is poison ivy. It has leaves of three, and you especially want to be concerned about poison ivy because when you're doing burning, you create smoke and you can inhale poison ivy smoke and that could cause a problem. So if you notice that there's poison ivy out there, and like right here, we actually have some poison ivy, which is in the middle right next to the barberry clump, you want to make certain that you're not standing in the smoke coming out of the burning so you don't get poison ivy. One of the things is propane torches can be useful uh, for some species like Japanese barberry. 
but they're not very useful in some other invasive species like bittersweet because bittersweet has all of its buds are below ground. And while the torch can kill the above ground tissues, in other words, it'd be the same as cutting it off, all the below ground buds are then going to sprout and you're going to have more of a problem. So with something like bittersweet, you're better off just cutting it the first time. It's a lot quicker and you don't have the fire danger. Yeah, normally when uh, we're working out in the woods burning, we only do it after about at least a half inch rainfall to make sure all the leaf litter, that's the leaves on the ground and the sticks are nice and wet and we won't start a fire. If it's right near a house and you have a hose and you have permission of your local fire marshal, you might be able to come out and burn on a day like today, which is a little bit drier, but not wet. And Tom's gonna to demonstrate how you wanna soak down the area, but make certain, just like with a campfire, that everything is totally wet and there's absolutely no smoke coming out even five minutes after you put out all the fire. Go ahead. To start up the torch, once you have your equipment, make sure your equipment's right. You wanna make, turn the pile light on and you wanna get a torch with a pile light so you aren't constantly relighting it. Then making sure you're wearing leather gloves Use a sparker, not a propane torch, because a propane, I mean a propane lighter, because a propane lighter could actually potentially catch on fire. Then you, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up to the plant and we're gonna heat it until the plant starts to glow. Once it glows, we've killed all the tissues. And if we're able to focus in a little bit later, we'd be able to see that we have very little impact on the surrounding vegetation. So here goes. Now, depending upon the size of the plant, you might only need a couple seconds. You might need 10 seconds. We'll do another plant here. And now we've effectively killed all above ground tissues on that plant, and we've probably killed most of the latent buds that are right on the surface. One of the other things we want to point out is that this nozzle is very hot. I mean, we're wearing leather gloves. So you want to let the nozzle cool off before you put it on the forest floor and certainly before you touch yourself. We commonly use drinking water, or in this case, a garden hose. The first thing that we want to do when we treat a Japanese barbarian infestation is cut down larger stems using a brush saw. Um, cutting it down first uh, makes it easier for subsequent treatments such as uh, using a propane torch or herbicide. Um, here's my brush saw behind me and we have, have a, a special blade that we use that we found to be the most effective. Um, but before I turn it on and start using it, I wanna put on some uh, face and eye protection. That's the most important step. Yeah, if you start in a typical barberry infestation, commonly it's three, four feet high, occasionally six or seven feet high. But if, if you were to mow it, and up here we have an example of where we mowed some. By the following summer, this was mowed last fall, by the following summer it's already regrown up again. So mowing by itself isn't a solution. Barberry is going to come back. So you've got two options at this point. One option is you could come out here with a propane torch and kill it. The other option is is you could come out with herbicide, but notice rather than treating a big tall plant before, now we're treating a much smaller plant. And you can come out and just give it a quick spray. And you can be very directed on where you're spraying and where you're applying. And be able to kill the barberry, and in this case, bittersweet, another invasive species that's mixed in. One thing if you are using spray, it's useful to add dye. And we have uh, blue vegetable dye in here. They actually sell dyes to mix in. So you know where you sprayed and to make sure that you're not uh, spraying a plant twice and to make sure that you're not missing any plants. If you start with a big plant like this, to spray with herbicide, it takes quite a bit of herbicide to spray the whole plant. You can see we're out here for quite a little while. 
There's advantages if we look over here on this side here, a little bit to your right, you notice that we have much smaller barberry plants. These were ones, again, that were uh, mowed last spring. But now rather than do that whole plant, now we can do a whole lot of little plants with much, much less herbicide, maybe a quarter of the herbicide. So we really reduce the amount of herbicide that's used out in the landscape. Uh, this is a plant which we torched last fall. And while torching work, it's not a panacea. You can notice that we do have a couple of small stems coming back out. So at this point, you have two options. You can either come back and use a propane torch a second time, or you could come back and as you can tell, there'd be a very small plant just to hit a little spot spade with herbicide to kill it off. But it is an effective tool. Just realize that nothing is a magic bullet. It's gonna take real work to control the invasive species that you have on your property. Now that you've watched the first two videos in this three-part series and have learned all about barberry and how to control it, Watch the final video, Facts About Lyme Disease, to learn how it's contracted, its symptoms and treatments, and the steps you can take to minimize your risk of contracting this disease. Thanks for watching.